I'm so excited to be speaking with Marie Roberts today. She's one of my own personal heroes, and um, she was my first voice teacher. She's the person who kind of figured out that I had a voice, um, <laughs> a voice in there, and she really worked with me and, I mean, helped get me into Juilliard, and I wouldn't be the person that I am today had I not been able to um, be around this, this amazing woman and have her be a mentor in my life. So thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm really happy to be able to do this, Olivia. Um, I'm honored, of course, that you, that you asked me. Um, but we have a mutual fan club. I mean, we, we sort of have a mutual love affair here. And <laughs> every, everything that you said, I could say about you, um, my life is much richer because you have been in it and because you are in it and um, you fascinate me and you make me proud. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, that means the world to me coming from you. Um, well, I've been starting these with getting a bit of background from everybody. So can you tell everyone like, where did you grow up and what was your family like? Yes. Um, I grew up in Dublin, Georgia. Uh, I actually lived in Tifton for just a little bit of time in my childhood and started school in Tifton. Um, and interestingly enough, I didn't even know I was going to tell you this, but in Tifton is where I had my first performances. <laughs> yeah. Um, I went to kindergarten in Tifton at Mother Goose Kindergarten. <laughs> and we, had, we had a lady who came to kindergarten and I really don't know if she came once a day or once a week, but her name was Miss Blanche and she was an older lady and she would come and play the piano and sing with us. To me, that's one of my most vivid memories of kindergarten, even though I imagine she only came a time or two a week, you know, or something like that. Yeah. But Miss Blanche took, a, took notice of me some way and invited me at five years old to go sing for the ladies club in Tifton, a ladies, a ladies club in Tifton at Christmas time. So I remember being, um, being hoisted up on the top of a, an upright piano and I sat up on top of the upright piano and sang at the ladies uh, club in Tifton at five years old. So um, you later asked me in your questions about how I got into performing and I guess maybe, you know, those very early things, those very early things. And then I remember the first time I ever sang in church, I was about five years old and I sang the little chorus. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I sang that in an evening worship service um, in Tifton at about five years old. So very early on, I remember performing, um, in that little way it wasn't performing to me you know I just did what anybody asked me to do but so anyway I went to school in Tifton um, at and the first and second grade and then my dad was transferred back to Dublin which was um, where I had been born and where my mother and her entire family were reared and all of my my mother's family was from Dublin so um, stayed there until I left to go to Mercer in 1980. So Dublin is, is home. Um, my parents, uh, are Ted and Loretta Gerald, um, mother grew up in Dublin. My dad was from, um, Oh, Georgia, <laughs> which, is, which is, um, out Toombs County outside of Vidalia. And, um, all of his family was there. So I have a lot of, um, strong roots in um, southeastern Georgia, um, but have one wonderful sister, Dan, and she's four years younger than I am, four and a half, and um, we have a beautiful friendship, and uh, she also is a musician, and so a lot of my favorite performing moments have been when I've sung with Janet. She's another, um, another woman who definitely inspires me and um, 
just an incredible lady like yourself. And actually, both of you were Miss Dublin and went on to compete at Miss Georgia. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's, yeah, I can. Um, and Janet was not Miss Dublin. Um, oh. She was Miss St. Patrick's. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, yeah, you have to you have to know all about these things in Dublin. <laughs> I was Miss Dublin. Janet was Miss St. Patrick's. But Janet actually went to Miss Georgia as Miss Mercer. Oh. Miss, Miss Mercer. Years ago, Mercer had a pageant. Um, and I went to Miss Georgia as Miss Dublin. And let me see. That was, I believe that was in 1983. I should have looked that up. I, I, I believe I went to Miss Georgia in 1983, um, and you had asked how I got started in pageants. Yeah. Well, also in Tifton, I was in the Little Miss Tifton pageant, which was, <laughs> you know, the Little Miss, um, and I guess we, I don't remember if we had anything to do with the Miss Tiftons and the Miss Georgia, but I think it was a part of all of that. But anyway, I did that. Um, I didn't win, and I remember as a little girl how sad that was, you know, to be in the pageant and not to win, and I think I was totally too young to participate in something like that, um, because you, you do, at five years old, you don't understand, and you think, well, was I not pretty enough? Was my dress not pretty enough? What, why did my friend win and I didn't win? You know, I think I was just totally too young to understand all of that. But I remember doing it and it was fun. So. <laughs> I mean, it's hard enough as an adult to compete and deal with all of that, much less when you're five. Um, I just think that's, so, I definitely think that helped me and gave me a little bit of an edge when I was competing in pageants because it was something that you were already familiar with. So you knew, you know, what song does well at a pageant and you really knew how to help me work on it in a way that kind of fit into that pageant world. So I definitely think that helped me later. <laughs> yeah. Well, it probably helped me too. Um, it helped me be prepared that you don't win mm. a lot of the times. You know, I think at a very early age, I learned what it was that you don't win just because you do this. And so maybe you're right. I, I haven't thought about that, but it probably did prepare me in some ways that you can't go into this thing thinking you're going to win this. Um, nor is that even the most important thing I have learned since. Um, I do believe that my pageant experience had a lot to do with self-confidence, with confidence on stage, I didn't know then that I would choose the career path that I did, or maybe that that career path would choose me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't know then, but the experience that I had with presenting myself on stage and to a group of people was invaluable experience, mm -hmm. it, as it turned out. Um, I even remember at one Met audition, um, many years later, a woman asked me this question. This is going to come out. I don't mean it the way it's going to come out. Okay. She said, um, how, or no, how did she phrase that? She said, where did you get what you have on stage? Mm -hmm. And I stopped to think about that. And I said, you know, the only answer that I can give you is that I, I did pageants mm. and she said, that explains it. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I know that that was a compliment because I won the award for stage presence at that Met audition, wow. <laughs> which is totally about singing, which should tell you something. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, I remember being asked that question and that was the only answer I had. Um, I, and I do believe that's right. And an, because all during my um, late teen and early 20s, I did pageants. And um, you learn how to present yourself. You, you learn 
the confidence that it takes to walk on stage and present yourself. So, um, yeah. Um, but anyway, so I guess I got into pageants, first of all, because my parents entered me at such a young age, and then later because I had a talent. Um, I, for me, it was not nearly as much about um, how I looked or how every, you know, all of that. It was because I had a talent. And I thought that that made me unique because at that time there were many girls who entered and they had to figure out something to do because they didn't have a talent. Um, I, I, even then, I thought that was so sad that someone would enter something and they didn't have an artistic way to express themselves. Um, my, my mother always wanted to study piano. Um, and she never had that opportunity as a young girl. She grew up in a very uh, simple, nearly underprivileged way uh, on a farm. Um, my granddaddy raised pigs and drove a school bus and they grew up very, very simply. And she always wanted to take piano lessons, but it was never, never, a, they were never, never able to provide that, um, so she made sure that we did. Mm. And so I began piano lessons at five. Boy, I did a lot of things at five years old, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I started piano lessons then, and I studied piano all the way through school every year and continued, actually entered Mercer as a piano major, changed my major after the first year to voice. But um, anyway, you know, having a talent, having something that I enjoyed presenting artistically is really why I entered pageants and really why I was never afraid because I knew, you know, that I had a, an artistic expression um, that I enjoyed sharing. Um, so I played in the first couple of pageants that I did and later began to sing for my talent. I didn't know that. I didn't know you played piano for talent. Yes. In the first, I did not know that. Yeah, well, I did. I mean, obviously, like you said, you went to Mercer to study voice and um, you are now a voice teacher, which we'll, we'll talk about. But so for you, I mean, being a performer involved, like you said, met competitions and, and different, different things like that. And how did you how did you make the transition from performer to teacher? Like at what point did you say, it's time to walk away from this or did you? It was a gradual thing. And I would say it was the result of my education. Mm. Um, the more I learned, the more I discovered truly what my gifts were. I still love to sing and, and I was a, I was a, I was a fairly good singer. <laughs> you still are a very good singer. <laughs> well, thanks. I, but I, I began to realize that being a singer is a very difficult thing. It's not just about how well you sing. To choose to try to follow the path of being a professional singer means that you are quite self-focused. I don't want to say self-centered because I know many, many singers who are not self-centered. They're very uh, um, successful without being self-centered. But a professional singer must be very self-focused. And I think that I was just too interested in many other things to be quite that self-focused. Um, I began to teach the minute I was out of my uh, master's degree. I had taken a vocal pedagogy course while I was there and I excelled in that course. And my teacher uh, Dr. Jay Wilkie, who is no longer with us, but 
whom I loved and still am so thankful to Jay Wilkie for um, his tutelage and his guidance. He asked me to be uh, the grad assistant for his vocal pedagogy class after I had taken the class. So the final year of my master's studies, I was a grad assistant. Um, and I, I excelled in that area. And immediately, I'm very grateful that I was asked by um, Southern Seminary, where I did my master's degree, to teach there as soon as I finished graduating, as soon as I finished my degree. <laughs> so opportunities came to me that helped me to negotiate that. For a while, I walked a parallel path. Um, while we were in Louisville, I sang and performed uh, a lot in the Louisville area, did the Met auditions that I did in, in Kentucky there, then down in Nashville, and then at the, um, at the regional level in Memphis um, while I was also teaching. So I was studying, I was driving to Indiana and studying with Virginia Zayani after my master's degree. and continuing to perform, but I was coming home and teaching at Southern, at Indiana University Southeast, and at Bellarmine College. I was teaching at three places. So I would just say that opportunity came uh, to teach, and I found that it, that it energized me and excited me in a much different way than performing. And I think in the long run, it energized and excited me more to work with someone else and help them develop their gift um, even more than it excited me to perform myself. I love that. I, and you know that I feel very similarly um, in that I always found it very difficult that that level of, like you said, self-focus that it takes. And I think it was Renee Fleming who said in her book, I believe that um, if you can do anything else, you should. Um, and I just, I think that that's so true. And going to school and studying voice, j just like you did, I had those peers who absolutely couldn't do anything else. And that was, there was no question that that was what was destined for them. But for me, it was always, there were a hundred other things that I was interested in and a hundred other things that I wanted to do too, which I think took away from that directness that it takes yeah. to be successful in that industry. So I just, I think that was a beautiful way to put it, that self mm -hmm that self-determination and that self-focus that it takes to be a singer in the classical industry. Um, but speaking of your teaching, you, you have this incredible gift of hearing a singer and really being able to understand their unique sound. And I have found in studying with other teachers, that's a very rare trait. And not everyone has that ability to really hear a singer, understand the voice and not try to change it, but to help it grow on its own trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, and so you are a mentor to many young people in that way and you hear their voices and you, you help them to grow. And, and how do you encourage the young women specifically that you work with to stay true to their own individuality in an industry that is so unforgiving, especially to women, and in an industry that sometimes it feels like they encourage conformity? How do you empower those young women to stay true to themselves and their sound? That was a hard question, one of the hard ones, <laughs> um, because I had to actually stop and ask myself, do I do that? You know, you've asked me these questions, and, and so I, I have to say, do I do that? I hope I do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do. I think I really do try. The main thing is I see every person as an individual, as you said, I don't have certain expectations for a person when they walk into my studio, except to help them sing better. And for me, helping someone find, uh, helping someone in their vocal growth has so much to do also with who they are as a person. Mm -hmm. uh, every voice is as unique as every individual, you mm -hmm. know, um, and so I do not take a one-size-fits-all approach with teaching 
some people need more listening mm. as some people need more counseling. <laughs> some people need more encouragement. Some people need more, um, to learn more self-management. Mm. Um, and so I try very hard to see the person as a whole male, female, age doesn't matter. I've taught all ages too. Um, but I just try to see them as a unique individual right there with a unique instrument. And I go from there. Uh, I do a lot of listening. I try to listen very much to the voice, but to what is coming from inside a person that I hear in their voice. Um, the voice is very complex and it is totally affected by where someone is as a person. Um, if they're happy or sad or afraid or confident or hurt, mm. it comes out in the voice. And so I try to be very aware of all of that in teaching someone. <clears throat> as far as specifically for women, a woman's voice might perhaps be even more susceptible to all those things that I just mentioned. Um, yep. <laughs> I think so. Uh, women seem to be uh more diversely emotional people um or maybe we're just be better at letting at allowing our emotions to be a part of who we are i think we're more encouraged to do that than men absolutely I think you're right men are encouraged you know not to to be that way and which is not good Right. Uh, <clears throat> many women seem more comfortable with sharing their emotions, mm. but emotions do come out in the voice. Um, about this business, this, um, this kind of artistry being harder for women. I think it, in in the opera world mm. it's hard because there are so many more women who are singing and who want to sing mm. so immediately the judgment on each individual voice is harsher because decisions have to be made um, there are so many more women who pursue singing. You can see that in the number of voice majors in any school. There are more women and there are more sopranos than anybody. So if you're a woman and you're a soprano, you are going to face much tougher criticism, much tougher judgment, and a lot of rejection. So I do try to prepare my women students, especially the Sopranos. You're one of a million out there and there are a million who are as good as you are. And you must know that. Um, now, every person has something that makes them unique. And if you can find what your unique gift is and let that become a part of your singing, a part of your artistry, then you, then you automatically distinguish yourself from those millions. But just being a woman in this profession makes you um, open to more judgment, more criticism. One thing I really feel positive about, though, in the opera world, if we want to just say opera, um, but maybe that bleeds over into the commercial singing world. The, is that I do believe that the vocal gift is the first thing uh, and the main thing that is qualified or judged. However, uh, we do see still in the opera world 
especially now that it's so much more televised, so much more videoed, so much more a visual presentation, we do see discrimination um, in um, whatever a conception of beauty is or whatever a conception of um, the appropriate figure for stage or for a certain role. Uh, we do see that. We do see that analyzed at least, if not discriminated. <clears throat> as a singer, because it is a visual presentation as much as an aural one, everything about us is qualified uh, when we are heard and seen. Uh, how we present physically, um, is qualified by those who are listening and watching. Mm -hmm. So I do talk with my singers about that, um, especially if I have a singer who I feel like does not take a lot of care with their personal appearance. And I think that has nothing to do with uh, figure. Um, it has to do with confidence in personal presentation. So I do talk with singers about taking care with their personal presentation because I believe that if we don't take care with our personal presentation, it also shows that we might not be taking care with our gift. Um, you, you, you must care about the package that your gift comes in and like it or not, that's our bodies. Mm -hmm. Our gift comes in this package. Um, now, great presents come in all shapes and sizes. And I would like to see the professional singing world embrace that more. I would like to see the stage represent um, Walmart more. You know, <laughs> what the regular... Uh, uh, population actually looks like and um and that would come in all shapes and sizes so and colors and uh, you know everything uh, and um gender and everything there are beautiful people who represent every combination of things but i think it's important when we are presenting our gift as an artist that we do remember we are the packaging for that for that gift um and so we should take care in, in presenting ourselves with our gift. I love that. And I think that is really what sets voice apart. And it's something that I became extremely aware of, you know, at an art school where I'm in class with violinists and pianists and other instrumentalists where their instrument is this physical thing that they can care for and, um, you know, that they, they make sure is, is treated with the utmost care and respect. Whereas with the voice, it's, you know, this intangible thing that is within us. And so we are the instrument and that does include our entire body. So as an instrumentalist would, would take, you know, the most care of their instrument, we have to take the most care of ourselves. And that does include our presentation. And I like what you said, it's not about the size. It's not about the color. It's about being confident enough in what you have to take pride in it because that shows. And I think, that that's so important and it's it's just vital that singers know that and that we treat ourselves like a valuable violin because that's that's what we are you know right i, I think, love that i think i like what you said too olivia that it's about valuing ourselves mm -hmm. um i think sometimes when you see people who are not well groomed there's a problem there there's a problem there 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 is some hurt or some lack of self-confidence or something that makes them not value themselves enough to care for themselves mm -hmm. and um i i have had singers like that come through my studio and i tried gently very gently to work on that um because like it or not the world does qualify us um, we don't have to bend to it. Mm -hmm. If someone is totally against bending to that, 
then I say, go ahead. Even if you're a concert singer or recitalist or commercial singer requires a huge amount of stamina, physical stamina, and you can have great physical stamina and health at lots of sizes. Yeah. So it's very much about just being healthy from your core. Mm -hmm. um, so I do talk with singers about that, but I do try um, to help people realize that they will be qualified. And that's, a, that's one of the tough things about choosing this career. It's interesting that you brought up the, uh, the quote that, uh, that Renee Fleming also says, if there's something else you can do, please do it. Because I say that to every young singer who comes in with stars in their eyes. You know, I'd say, <laughs> you know, this is difficult. You need to sing because you love it. And you need to always sing because you love it, whether it's your profession or not. And you may remember my saying, if there's something else that you can do, and be happy getting up every day to do it, then you should do that and let singing be this wonderful um, enhancement to your life. Yeah. But if you will die, <laughs> if you don't do this, then you better do it. Yeah. You know, if you're going to die, if you don't do this, then I'm going to help you do it. <laughs> I'm going to try to help you do it. Yeah. Um, so I, to I totally agree with, with everything that you just said. Um, and speaking of mentorship, you know, like you're a mentor to your students, you're also mother to two incredible young men who I've had the pleasure of, of growing up with and coming to love so, so much. Um, and now is such an important time in history where women are really demanding respect and challenging that boys will be boys mentality that has existed in our culture for so long. So as a boy mom, how have you raised your sons not to be a part of the problem, but a part of the solution? That was one of the hard questions. Yeah. <laughs> and at first I thought, Ooh, I'm not sure I did. <laughs> I hope I did. No, I decided that I did do that but I didn't do it with my words particularly unless there was a situation to speak to that specifically. I believe that Stanley and I, Stanley's my husband of 36 years almost. Wow. Yeah. I know that's hard to believe. It's gone by really fast. Um, but anyway, I think we, try to rear Blake and Bo to see a person as a person. Not first as a girl or a boy or not first as a white person or a person of color. And we didn't even know that term person of color. That's kind of new. I mean, but not to see those kind of identifiers first, but just to see a human being, a person. And I believe that we tried to do that by the organizations and situations which we chose, in which we chose to be engaged. Mm -hmm. For example, the parade of people that have come into our house, into our home through the years has been extremely varied and diverse. When I stopped to think about that, it made me feel so happy, you know, because I thought about all the people that my children were exposed to because they came into my home. Um, the, the church environment that we chose was highly important in helping them to see women in leadership roles I think one of the proudest moments of my life was not when either of them hit a home run or, you know, made a good grade or did something great. But when Bo, as a, as a young boy, about 
maybe 10 or 11 or 12, I don't know, maybe a little older than that, probably young teenage. We were talking one day about our favorite preachers, and I don't remember how it came up, but Bo said, Miss Julie is my favorite preacher. And it made me so happy because I thought how few young men in even in this day and time, to use a phrase, have been exposed to women in ministerial roles and are comfortable enough with it and accept it as the normal thing to be able to say, Miss Julie's my favorite preacher. Mm -hmm. And it made me thrilled. It made me feel like a good mom, like we were good parents because we had given them the experience of seeing a variety of people in leadership roles. Um, my own family, very Southern, very, very Southern. My grandparents grew up with a completely different mindset about race, about the role of women, uh, those kinds of issues than I came to value. Um, but I do remember specifically when the boys were small and little, when we would experience when we were at home visiting for the holidays or other things, if there were things that happened that were wrong to me, or the result of prejudiced perceptions. Mm -hmm. I always discussed it with them later. Um, if, if anything off color was said, or I like, I like that prejudiced perceptions were presented by family members, you know, who, quite frankly, you know, had not evolved enough <laughs> yet. <laughs> we always, I always tried to discuss that and say, you know, what that, the joke that that person told or the remark that that person told was not something that we believe is right. It's not how I want you to view other people in the world. Um, and it's not how your dad and I view other people in the world. And I hope that they understood some of that simply because the environments in which we chose to live and to expose them to a variety of other people were environments that were not prejudiced, uh, that were not exclusive of people for any reason. So I don't think that I set out to, to think I have to teach them this way. But along the way, I believe we were very careful and very um, intentional about the environments, the kind of environment that we placed our family in. Yeah. And even about where we chose for them to go to school. Um, I always wanted them to be in schools where diversity was celebrated. Um, and I believe both of them have had richer educational and experiential backgrounds because they were in uh, environments that celebrated diversity. Absolutely. And I know that Bo has talked about how much going to Howard, a public school has, um, you know, affected who he is and how much he enjoyed that experience. So, um, right. I just think that's amazing. And I, you know, studies, studies literally show that, uh, you know, children learn more from their parents' actions and from their parents' words. So it really does take, leading by example and creating an environment that encourages inclusivity. And that's absolutely what you've done. And, um, 
you know, you've got two of the best boys I've ever met. So I, um, yeah, I think they turned out pretty well. They're very different. They're very different. They're very different. <laughs> They're very different, but they both do have, you know, um, they're both, both, um, they both can embrace, I think, anyone that they might come in contact with. I believe that they can embrace and um, have a good relationship with anyone who might cross their paths. And so I'm very happy about that. Well, I'll tell you a moment you could be proud of Bo. I hope he doesn't kill me for saying this, but I will never <laughs> forget this. Um, at my high school graduation party, you know, Bo was there and um, Mackenzie and I were actually talking about, we, we were complaining about how we felt like boys our age didn't really understand us and, you know, they always kind of went with girls who were a little bit less outspoken than we were. Um, and he said, you know, they're intimidated by you guys. He goes, you two are strong women and you can take care of yourselves. And I think that that's intimidating to a lot of guys, but you just have to, you know, wait because you're the kind of, you know, you're someone that, that men are going to want to marry. And that's when he was like, you know, what, 16 or 17 years old. So for him to be that, I mean, aware and to be able to celebrate Mackenzie and I being strong female presences in his life, I, that was I've, I've never heard a young man say anything like that. So that was a big, wow. isn't that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, and you know, one day you'll, you'll, you'll think about this moment and you'll, as a mom, the best thing in the world is when somebody tells you something wonderful about your child that you didn't know. <laughs> and I knew, I know that he's a wonderful person, but something that they did that was wonderful that you didn't know about you'll remember this moment and you'll say, oh, that it is, it's the <laughs> best. It's just the best when someone tells you something that your child did that was wonderful that you had no idea about. I would only want them to date strong women. Um, I think that I'm a strong woman and I hope that that example, because Stanley has allowed me to be a strong woman, um, I hope that that example translates to them in their choices for a life partner. Um, two strong individuals, I believe, make a much happier marriage. Um, each person needs to be strong as an individual and to respect that about the other. And I think marriages are much happier when both people are strong, independent people. I love that. Well, you are a very strong person. Um, so I guess moving forward a bit, a few years ago, you were diagnosed with breast cancer. And I believe on that same day, it was the same day, wasn't it? It was. <laughs> you, were, you were scheduled to give a recital. Um, and I, I remember I was there at the recital and, and you, you chose to perform and it was beautiful. But what was going through your head when you received that diagnosis and, and why did you choose to perform on such a, such a big day like that? It was August the 27th, 2018. You know, um, as we age as singers, it's not as easy to sing anymore. Um, and I do think that the, the female soprano voice ages faster than any other voice. Mm. And honestly, Olivia, I had worked so hard all summer on those three little songs <laughs> that I was going to sing. <laughs> these three leader, you know, these three lead, lead these three German pieces. Um, so... I, I went to the doctor that day and got the results of, of the mammogram and um, my doctor, Dr. Conforti, whom I love, said, it is cancer and there will be some follow-up and some things that we will learn more about the kind of cancer and how it will be treated, but that was in the afternoon and it was a little bit like a gut punch to hear those words, it is cancer. 
And he said it just like that, which I appreciate. Mm. And for a split second, I considered, how will I sing tonight? This is too huge. How will I sing? But it was only a split second. I knew that everything else in my life was bigger than cancer. And I was going to sing that night because I had planned to. I was prepared to. I wanted to. And so I did. And honestly, I believe that the decision that I made that day shaped everything that would come after in knowing that cancer would not be the biggest thing in my life. It might have to be the focus of my life for a little while, but it would not be the biggest thing in my life. And I think that I gained so much from singing that night because I proved to myself that cancer would not take anything from me, even if I had to give it my full focus for a while, it would not take anything from me. And it didn't. Olivia, if I had to relive the last two years and had choices about what would happen in those two years, I would not choose not to have cancer. I learned so much about myself and other people from my journey with cancer. I never viewed it as a fight. I viewed it as something that I had to work through, that I had to embrace. For me, embracing the diagnosis and the treatment and the modifications that I had to make to my life were more about living well than about fighting well. And I believe that I learned to live well, even knowing that I had cancer and that I was fighting it. And I'm a better person on the other side of that. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Um, I just, you're just incredible. Um, I didn't want cancer. No, no, no one wants cancer. But I learned so much about the goodness of other people and about my own strength that I wouldn't change it now. Can you talk a bit about your journey with body image while going through chemo and eventually losing your hair? Um, I know that people say like, oh, it's, you know, it's just hair, it grows back, but when it's not your choice to lose it, you know, when it's, when it's a choice that you, you don't get to make, how did you love yourself through treatment? Do you remember that night after the recital? that we were sitting in the rookery at the table <laughs> and um, I don't know whether you'll include this or not, but my best friends who are not relatives of mine are your mother, Tracy and Sonia Milam. Uh, they are my two best friends. Um, my sister is also my best friend, but non relatives, your mother and Sonia. And we were all sitting there with you. And Sonia said, we're all going to shave our head. And I went, whoa, whoa. I don't even know if I'm going to have, if I'm going to lose my hair. I don't, we weren't even that far, you know, along in the diagnosis. And I remember going, stop. 
I just found out today that I have cancer. I don't think I can think about losing my hair today. <laughs> But lo and behold, she must have had some kind of <laughs> premonition about it because in in a in another couple of weeks, um, actually one week after I had the surgery to remove uh, the cancerous place, um, they call that a lumpectomy, and I hate that word. That's the most undignified word in the world. <laughs> <laughs> lumpectomy come on <laughs> can we think of something better than lumpectomy but anyway a week after my lumpectomy um i was told that it would require chemotherapy that was another gut punch and mostly i just listened to what the doctors and nurses had to say and so they began to tell me about chemotherapy and that it would be a, a year-long experience. Um, and the nurse, after, even after the doctor had gone, the nurse came in and began to tell me. She was so matter-of-fact. She said, you know, you will get sick and you will lose your hair, but it will grow back. And she told me all the other things, you know, that that I could expect with chemotherapy or that might happen. Um, and I just decided right then that my hair did not define me, that just like cancer would not prevent me from living well, hair or no hair, I could be me. I could be strong and I could be happy even having chemotherapy and no hair. I learned during cancer and let me see if I can say this the way I want to say it that even the unpleasant in life can be embraced and even celebrated. Because the unpleasant experiences in life help us understand who we really are. So I embraced it all and tried my best to celebrate it as a life-expanding experience. Now, I realize that I'm also incredibly fortunate because I'm cancer free today. And there are many people for whom that is not the outcome. The realization of that was also a part of the great lesson of cancer that we do not know what is around the next corner. We cannot know what is around the next corner. So living well today makes us ready to embrace and live with whatever is around the next corner. So I did okay about having no hair. I bought hats. I bought scarves. Um, I, never, I never did really want to go completely bald. For one thing, it's kind of cold. <laughs> you feel you feel really you don't realize how much warmth your hair gives you. Um, and I I had chemotherapy during the winter during flu season, so um, I I wanted to stay warm, and so I wore scarves and hats and things. Um, and it was kind of that was an adventure, a new adventure to me. I wasn't a hat person, and so I. I, I got to experiment a little bit with that. Um, but some women are very bold and they, you know, they go completely hairless into the world to say, I'm strong and I'm dealing with this and it's not going to defeat me. And I celebrate that with them if that's how they were comfortable. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been comfortable that way, mainly because I think it makes other people uncomfortable sometimes. And I never want to make other people uncomfortable 
with a choice that I would make. I don't think you, you don't, I don't know that you want to include that because it's something that we would have to really delve into um, because I don't think I'm responsible for how anybody else feels. But um, I remember that you had said you would shave your head if, if, yeah. I, if I was going to lose my hair. And I remember our talking about that and I told you that it would stress me to no end for you to do that. It would have been a burden that I didn't want. Mm -hmm. I didn't want anybody else to shave their head in solidarity with me. That would have stressed me to no end and burdened me in a way that I didn't need. <laughs> quite frankly, at that time. It's enough to deal with cancer and chemotherapy and how it's affecting the people who love you and the people that you love without people go to extreme measures to be in solidarity with you, even though I appreciate the idea that someone would. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What else did I did I miss something? No, that was um, that was it. I mean, talking about like body image and things like that because I know um, breast cam cancer in particular, although it does affect men, it's you know much more common in women, and I think um, it, it's such an intimate form of cancer as a woman. You know, I don't know if you have thoughts about that or anything you want to. It is a very intimate form of cancer, breast cancer. <clears throat> I remember thinking, what if I have to have a mastectomy? That's so huge to imagine being without your breasts. I questioned the doctors thoroughly because I was willing to have one and almost there was a part of me that wanted to have one because I wanted to, I wanted the cancer to be gone. Mm -hmm. I wanted obliterate. I wanted obliterated. I wanted it obliterated, but they assured me that I did not need to have a mastectomy. And so we just went with that undignified word lumpectomy. Um, but it is a very intimate kind of cancer because women and their breasts it it makes us it's part of what makes us not men um, um you know one of the hardest things for me <laughs> was um i remember thinking oh well i'm gonna have chemotherapy maybe i'll lose a little weight <laughs> and Dang it if I didn't gain 15 pounds. <laughs> and, um, you know, so you never know what's going to happen to you. Um, the, the medications that are used now with chemotherapy are so much better that oftentimes you, you don't lose weight as, as used to. Everybody lost weight when you had chemotherapy. So, no, I gained weight. And probably from a, the opposite of what you would think, that was difficult for me. That was difficult for me. I've always been a small person. Um, and so to gain weight during an already difficult experience was hard for me. Um, and now uh, being 57, it's a difficult thing to get rid of it. Um, so I am still managing all of the changes in my perception of body image that come with aging and also chemotherapy and cancer. Um, and I think that I'm evolving as a person about that. 
Um, and it's all about me, not about anyone else. It's about how, how I've always perceived myself and how I want to see myself. So I'm having to adjust somewhat to a new um, qualification of myself um, as, as a more voluptuous person. <laughs> And that's the word I like to use for it. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, what advice would you give to a woman who maybe just got her diagnosis or is really in the thick of treatment? How would you encourage them to keep, to keep moving forward? Olivia, cancer is such a personal thing. It is different for every individual. It must be because we all go along thinking about other people who have cancer, not ever really thinking, oh, I'm going to have cancer. We, we think about cancer as the thing that other people have, even if it's our mother or our sister or our aunt, it, until it is me it doesn't quite become real and all this i only say from my own perspective for every individual it is different so i will say what i say from a very personal perspective I believe that you must decide that cancer will not take the joy in life from you and that your life is much more and much larger than cancer. Cancer is just one little facet of what could happen to us as human beings. It's just one experience of the many experiences we have or we might have as a human being. I am so much more than a cancer survivor. I am a cancer survivor and I'm thankful for that. And it wasn't just me who made that happen. The wonderful doctors, nurses, physicians, researchers, uh, scientists in drug labs, and my wonderful family and friends made me a survivor. But I am much more than a cancer survivor. That's what made me sing that night because I just didn't want to be defined as that person with cancer. And that, what, that is what makes me continue on now. You may not know that the form of cancer that I had was an extremely aggressive kind, as well as a kind that often reappears. However, it was caught extremely early. For that, I am grateful. Um, however, I would be less than honest to say that one of the things that will always be present for me is a certain amount of reality and realization that it could return. I, I will not let that define me either. If it returns, I will embrace it and I will live in spite of it. So 
to say to someone, um, to ask me how might I encourage someone else, I would just say that know that you are more than a cancer patient. Know that you are more than a chemotherapy patient. Know that you are more than a person who's ill um, and believe in celebrating all that you are in spite of being a cancer patient. Um, so you are cancer free. So will you talk a little bit about life after cancer and kind of finding your new normal? I think that you do have to find a new normal after cancer. Um, for me, I actually had to go into a, a semi-quarantine state because during my cancer, my neutrophils, um, the white count level in my body that helps us pr uh, fight infection, just bottomed out to nothing. My body didn't like chemotherapy very much. The chemotherapy killed everything it needed to in my body, but all the good stuff too. And so I had to be, I had to separate myself from people in a way that I had never done before. Um, coming out of that, out of that very quiet, secluded cocoon um, in which I had experienced cancer and the treatment for it was quite difficult. I had become a more quiet person, a more introspective person. I learned to celebrate being with myself more and to enjoy that. And so to re-enter the regular world was a bit traumatic. Um, I had not excluded myself from others, but had had to be secluded in some ways. So re-entering the normalcy of life was sort of difficult um, and a little bit shocking, actually. And here we are in another state of quarantine. Um, so for me, this quarantine has almost been like revisiting something that I already knew, a safe space, if I could describe it that way, another time for quiet and reflection. And the stress of this quarantining has been quite different than the stress of quarantining because of my own cancer. And it's because the world, the world is at risk here. And what we all do for each other by quarantining and being safe we are so dependent on each other right now in order to protect the world. That's a frightening thing. I was able to protect myself during cancer and I was in control of that, but I'm not in control of what everyone else does. And that makes this kind of quarantine more stressful even in many ways than my cancer quarantine was. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I re-entered and got back to nearly a state of what I think was normalcy, of being with others and full routine of activities, um, you know, no restrictions, only now to enter another period of restriction and routine change. And that has been very interesting. 
mm. to, to enter that again after having done that as a cancer patient. Well, and you, I mean, you never stopped teaching while you were in your cancer quarantine. So you became very familiar with giving, you know, video lessons, virtual lessons. And so, I mean, you must have been a pro at doing that this time. The virtual lessons must not have been. <laughs> I think I have to, my hair is starting to dry now. Is it doing something crazy? No, it looks good. <laughs> Pretty good. Okay, you can edit that part out. <laughs> or not, I don't care. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. You know, and that's something I, I, I didn't tell about the teaching and about cancer when you asked me about how did it change me, you know, how, how did I go on. And I, I can't believe I didn't say this, so please, please figure out where this needs to go when I was diagnosed with cancer and on that day I was to sing, a lot of it was because I wanted to say to my students, I am still who I am as an artist, as a teacher, as a musician, in spite of what's happened to me today. And so I sang that night, knowing that all my students would be in the audience as you were. And when in talking with the doctors about the treatment that would come and how it would affect me, my one question was, can I still teach? Can I still teach? And they said, we don't know. And I, and I remember that my biggest prayer, aside from my prayer that my family would be okay and be able to handle this and that it would not be too hard for them my biggest prayer was that I could still teach I knew that I could I could I could stay from away from anything that I needed to stay away from but I needed to teach I needed to continue to help other people grow in that way as an art as artists as people as whatever and so my prayer was that no matter what happens through this, I want to be able to teach. And, and I was able to. A lot of times I went to school in full mask with, with cans of Lysol and <laughs> spraying the room and wiping everything down. And my students knew that if they were even the slightest bit ill, they didn't come. And there were several weeks there uh, at different stages in my chemotherapy when I did not have the strength to go in or I was at too vulnerable a state um, with my immunity. And so the IT department at Mercer set up a wonderful microphone and camera in my studio at Mercer. And the students would come into the studio and I'd be at home like this, and we'd have our lessons that way. My students were incredible during that time. I think that they all worked harder and perhaps made larger gains in that time period, maybe than ever in my teaching experience before. And it, I think it's because we, we both worked as hard as we could work to overcome that um, adversity. Um, and I, my, students, my students embraced my cancer as a challenge to them to work harder and do better and sing better and be better. Mm. And that gave me so much hope and so much determination that we would come out of this on the other end as stronger people, better singers, um, you know, just more well as whole people, that we would be more well after my cancer experience than before. And everybody was better after that when when we had to quarantine for corona 
I knew, I knew that I could do it. Um, now, because I teach one on one, and I don't, um, I don't, I do have one class that meets weekly, and we did that with the gallery view, and we we've, we've all met weekly. But my work is one on one, and and that's the way that I work best. So for me, doing it this way was in many ways more intense than being in the studio. Um, I hear different things um, teaching this way. I'm not distracted <laughs> by anything else that's going on in the room. It's very focused mm. like this. And so in many ways, I think there are great benefits I would not want to do it like this all of the time because there are many things that we don't see and hear and experience as live, but it can definitely happen this way. And my students, once again, some of most of these students had gone through cancer with me um, in the studio. So they weren't concerned about this at all. They knew what to <laughs> We knew we were good. We could do this. And we'd come out fine on the other end. I have to grab my, so I can show you. Forgot oh, my look pillow. at your pillow. Oh, I love that. Oh. It's my favorite. It was on my bed, and I just realized, like, oh, I should have had this. Well, let me hold them um, in case. Take a, I'll take a screenshot this way. <laughs> Isn't that good? Yeah. So. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. This is like this is my favorite pillow. Thank you. Well, you know, sometimes you just walk by and it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I love this. This made my day, like getting this um, up at school because it was. I mean, you know how you know how school was, so it was really nice to get this. Um, but the last question that I have for you is after the quarantine, because obviously we're all at a bit of a standstill right now, what's next for you? What's next with teaching with your students? Well, obviously, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Every year, a few new ones come. And every year I think, how can it be any better than the last year? And every year, wonderful new young people come into my life. And it's just the greatest gift in the world to know that every fall, some wonderful new young people are going to come into my life. And I... I'm so excited that they're singers. I mean, that's wonderful because, because that's what I can help them, you know, do better. But, but beyond that, the expansion of my own soul that comes because of the, the, the new young people who come into my life every fall is something that I never, ever would have known uh, that it would be such a great, a great enhancement in my life and a great gift, a, a wonderful, what do we call it? fringe benefit. Oh my goodness. The fringe benefit of new young people in my life every fall is incredible. I never knew that would be when I started doing this. And now it's almost the primary thing. As I say, oh, well, we're going to sing and we're going to make you the best singer you can be or that I, I'm going to do the best I can to help you be the best singer you can be, but also just the sharing of person with new, wonderful young people every fall is incredible. So right now I have another, yet another wonderful tenor leaving. Um, he's going to stay this summer and study and get ready for grad school. So I will have him a little bit longer. Um, 
but have new voices coming in the fall and who knows you know one of them may be the next best whatever but i will say that what's next for me is that no matter who comes i want to take joy in what they do no matter what level they sing at I just want, I, I, I love taking joy in each person. Um, and so that's what's next for me. Now, uh, that's what I think is next because that's my plan that in the fall I'll still be teaching and new students will come and I'll start, I'll do the same thing over again, but it's totally different every year because the mix is totally different. Mm. That's another thing that I love about teaching. It always evolves. It's never the same. <laughs> Next week is not going to be like this week was. Every week is different because we are people and that changes everything. So as far as looking down the road to what I see, I think that I will teach for the rest of my professional career. Um, because it is what I love. I'm so thankful that the opportunities I had early on led me to do this. I'm not saying that I'm happy that I didn't have a performing career but I think it might have been for me a lonely thing mm. and that would have been difficult for me as a person I'll steal a quote that a friend of mine a peer here in town once said her name is Ellen Futural Hansen she once said that someone said to her, you know, you really could have been a wonderful singer. And she said, maybe I could have, but I'm just too well-rounded a person. And I think I totally agree with that. Uh, there are just too many, and we talked about this a little bit ago, there are just too many other things in life that I wanted to be involved in that if I had gone down that path of performing, which I don't mean this way it's going to come out either, Olivia, but I, I did have that opportunity. Uh, and that same meeting with the lady who was from the Met, who judged me at the Met auditions when she asked me what I had on stage, and I, I told her about that, she also said, I'm going to start a file on you. And she was on the board at the Met at the time. She said, I'm going to go ahead and start a file on you so that we can watch what you're doing and, and, and keep up with you. I didn't really know what that meant then, that she said that to me. And... And I went on doing exactly what I was doing then, you know, continuing to think I was going to sing and continuing to prepare, continuing to study and everything. And then other opportunities came that we chose as a couple how for, you know, what we wanted our lives to be like. So it's not that I could not have pursued that. I don't know if I'd have been successful but there were opportunities to continue pursuing it. So I'm so thankful that reasons, opportunities came that, and that I followed those opportunities mm. because I think that I was destined to be a, to be a teacher of singing more than a singing performer. I think that I was destined to be a teacher of singing. I don't think everybody gets to follow their destiny. 
and I've gotten to, and I'm incredibly thankful for that. It has brought the most wonderful people into my life, and I can't imagine my life not having had those people in it. You're one of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough for talking to me this afternoon and just being so vulnerable. And um, I've said before, I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown. I don't know if you've read any of her stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, she always talks about vulnerability being one of our greatest strengths. And the more that I do these interviews, the more I'm finding that to be true, because I feel so inspired and so empowered after speaking to incredible women like yourself. Um, so I just think we have to keep being open and keep being vulnerable and keep sharing our stories and, and owning our stories um, so that we give other people the strength to, to tell theirs and to own theirs. So thank you. you. Know, that reminds me what you're just saying. It reminds me of one more thing about the cancer thing, about the encouraging other women, about the vulnerability. The word for me during cancer was not vulnerability, but being transparent. Mm -hmm. The more transparent I was with other people about what I was experiencing, the more it allowed me to receive the kindnesses and grace from other people. By being transparent, it allowed other people to know what was happening to me and it allowed me to receive encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would encourage any woman who has been diagnosed with cancer, if she's able from a personal standpoint and her own personality to be transparent, it opens up avenues through which you receive encouragement and support from other people, other women, other people. Mm. Whereas if you close yourself off and you are not transparent, you close off avenues of incredible support that are there for you if you only open yourself to them. That The transparency thing was huge for me, Olivia, because a lot of people say, well, you, you know, you, you, you don't have to talk about this and you don't have to do it. And I was like, oh no. I need to be, I had to be quiet for a little while and deal with it. But transparency for me was the best way because for me, harboring a secret or harboring a difficulty was much more stressful than being transparent. Mm. I love that. Transparency. To all women, to all women, when you do have your mammogram, definitely have your regular mammograms, but have the 3D mammogram that is now available. Even if your insurance doesn't support it, try to figure out a way to have it. It's usually not a whole lot more expensive than the traditional mammograms, but the 3D mammogram is... I credit was saving my life because mine was caught so early. No physician could feel it. No one, they, they, they had a hard time seeing it on regular mammogram, mm. but with the 3d mammogram, they saw my cancer. It was in the first stage. It was an aggressive and, uh, easily recurring type. And so if it had not been caught, with that 3D mammogram, I would have gone another year with this aggressive form of breast cancer. So have your mammograms yeah. and have the 3D mammogram. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel like it's young women too. <laughs> you have experienced that. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's terrifying. You know, at 22, you find, you know, I found something and it was... Right. It was ter. I mean, and it was really in the midst of you, you were going through chemotherapy. And so I, you know, I kind of 
I don't think I would have been as, um, uh, I don't want to say aggressive, but aggressive in getting second, third opinions and really getting after it and making sure that it was something that I didn't need to worry about had I not watched you go through cancer and deal with it. So I, I think that also kind of educated me on it can really happen to anybody at any age. Um, cancer does not discriminate and it's important to be on top of your own health 